victory is what our goal is, right? That's why we're here, because just like Keith talked last week, this, this goal of a victory is a journey. We don't have victory just today. We don't just wiggle our nose or say a prayer and say, man, I've achieved victory. Now, you made a step. You, you grew incrementally. You made progress that day, but God has so much more for us. Ephesians 3 says he's got more than we could ever hope for or imagine. Whatever you can imagine, God's got more. Mm. He has more for you. <laughs> now, that song's powerful. But tonight, we're talking about some of the ugly stuff we got to go through <laughs> to get to the victory. It's almost like a law of physics that if we want something really good, that at least in commerce, we'd say we have to pay a price for it, right? Something really nice, big price. Something we want really bad. We gotta save long and hard and go through a lot to get it. There's a price to be paid. How many of you's father said there's nothing free, right? Yeah. And it, and it seems like it's just a law of physics, a law of nature that the good stuff isn't free. We have to pay for it. Maybe not with money, commitment, sacrifice, honesty, consistency, faithfulness. We have to pay a price. And uh, as beautiful as that song was, that's how ugly sin is. And I, I like your play on words there, Robert. Look what you've done hmm. is the words in that song because she's honoring God. But we're going to talk about, look what I've done. The trail of broken bodies and the trail of hurt people. The trail of sadness and sorrow. The things that we just shudder. We, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it because it hurts. And yet, that is one of the prices we have to pay for recovery. We can't ignore it. We can't neglect it we, we, and get to where we want to go. And so step eight is about stopping and, uh, and dealing with it. So I was thinking about this lesson, and I've got my Bible on my phone here. If you have your Bible with you, kind of let me know, and I'll let you read some verses uh, that we've got for tonight. But uh, I'm going to read out of Mark chapter 5, and if you got your Bible, follow along. But Mark chapter 5 is kind of a cool verse, uh, I think, to kind of cue things up for the evening. I'm going to start reading verse 24. Jesus is... Uh, Michael, I was just going to say, there are Bibles under a lot of these chairs mm -hmm. that you want to have. Yeah, grab yeah, one and just give me a high sign if you want to yeah, want to read as we go along. <laughs> I said we are in church. I'm sure there's Bibles in here. <laughs> there ought to be one or two. That's right. Uh, Mark 5 what? Mark 5, uh, beginning in verse 24. Now, just to set this up, Jesus is in a village... And a rich fellow came to him and he says, you know, my, my daughter's sick even to death. And so Jesus is following this fellow over to his house. It's kind of interesting how sometimes you, you think you're going someplace, but on the way to the someplace, Jesus has something, something, <laughs> something there for you. And so Jesus is walking in a crowd, and, and I'm just going to read it, and then we'll make some comments in the end here. It says, Jesus went with him, the, the rich fellow, Jairus. And all the people followed him. So just get this picture, right? A lot of people all crowding, says crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. The older translations say an issue of blood. We would say her menstrual cycle. She had this consistent issuance, right, uh, for 12 years. And I think whether you're a man or a woman, especially women, would understand that would just really be a horrible, horrible thing. I will stop give you a little background information. Uh, the law, the Old Testament said when a woman was having her period, is it okay to say period in, in church? <laughs> I'm feeling a little uncomfortable myself. Um, it's the truth, right? Yeah. 
uh, that uh, that she was adults. not to lie with her husband. All right, uh, she had to go to ceremonially purify herself after the time of her period before she could go back and kind of take her place as her husband's spouse and so forth. So if um, if you were in the middle of that cycle, you were considered to be unclean. Now just think about that. Unclean. Mm -hmm. Now that's just one type of person. So people that had leprosy, people that had all kinds of other ailments. Was, so for 12 years, 12 years, this woman has been unclean. In the mind of society, in the mind of her spouse, if she was married, in the mind of her family, she's unclean. And the mindset for a lot of these folks is what you do to make that happen. Right? Now, I don't, there's nothing in here that implies she's a sinner, but the Jewish mindset was, okay, done come on, wrong. <laughs> yeah, what you to do deserve this. Just imagine her mindset, though, right? So she suffered a great deal uh, from many doctors. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay for. Some of you have been to treatment centers that are not cheap. Some have been more than one. You could say you've spent a lot, if not all, your money trying to get well. This woman kind of gets that. She relates with that. She wanted to get well so bad, she would spend everything she had. But she had not gotten better. She actually got worse. She'd heard about Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight because you heard about this guy named Jesus who could save people from their, their wounds, can heal people, can save people from their predicament. So she came up behind it. And I think that's interesting too. She lived in shame. She didn't approach him from the front and put her hand out to greet him. She came from behind him. And you can imagine just her trying to meander through the crowd, trying to reach out to Jesus. She said she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. This is a quote. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Wow. That's the faith she had. Mm. She'd heard about Jesus, but she's like, if I could just get that close, I could be healed. You know, everything that we say here, you know, there's wisdom in the 12 steps, but the reason we, we couch them in Scripture, the, we, the reason we proclaim Jesus as our higher power is because he is the one, the only one that can truly heal us. If you just touch his robe. And so part of being here is just that reaching out and touching Jesus. Immediately, immediately, the bleeding stopped. Can you imagine? 12 years. Anybody struggle for 12 years? More, but yeah. 12 years. In this case, touching the robe of Jesus healed her. She could feel in her body she'd been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once the healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around the crowd and asked, Who touched me? His disciples looking around. At the crowd pressing, how, how, can, how can you ask who touched me? Look at all these people, right? Mm -hmm. the, the disciples are like, there's no way we could figure this out. But he kept on looking. I want you to listen. Jesus kept on looking. He wanted to know. He wanted to know because he wanted to engage with this lady. He cared, right? You know, his, his healing wasn't just about making somebody better. He wanted to to know that person. He wanted that person to know him. So uh, he kept on looking. The frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened, her came and fell on her knees. That's where, where it all begins, isn't it? On her knees. And uh, he 
He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. So do you have enough faith to reach out and just touch Jesus' robe? This lesson, the amends, is about admitting what we've done and being willing to make amends. Next lesson is making the amends. But you can't make them unless you dredge it all up. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because the victory, right? The victory. Um, so my, my sister's got cancer, and, and so far it looks good. Um, the, the victory looks like maybe in sight. We don't know for sure. But what has she had to go through to achieve the victory? Right. Treatment. Pain. Throwing up. Nausea. Surgeries. I mean, just surgeries all over her torso. All the ugliest with goes with wounds healing. She's had to go through that to get to a place of victory. You don't get to victory without dealing with all the ugliness that puts you in a position to need a victory. And acting like it didn't happen or it wasn't that bad doesn't help you or anyone. Sin is ugly. And it's just the word sin. It's not like addiction sin. It's not like alcohol sin. It's not like porn sin. It's, it's sin. Jesus died. And, and if, have you seen Passion of the Christ? Yes. I almost couldn't watch it. I went to the theater with my parents, and, and it was it was horrible. The blood and, and the violence all wrought on Jesus. And I think just how ugly that was, it was that ugly because that's how ugly our sin is. It couldn't be clean and neat because that's not what our sin is. There's nothing clean and neat about our sin because we were, we were with God in the beginning in the garden. And our sin has separated us from God. We're, we're in darkness and he's in the light. And Jesus now has come to bring us back into the light, to bridge that gap. And all of our sin, the lying, the cheating, the, the stealing, the, you know, the, uh, all of those things that, that, uh, that we would look, the selfishness, it keeps us in darkness. Addiction is a is a is a symptom of sin. Yeah. Alcohol is a symptom of sin. I'm talking addiction, right? It's a heart issue. And our our brokenness in our heart, our our independence, our selfishness that says, I don't really need God. It's ugly. And the only way to achieve victory is to recount it as much as we can remember, one at a time. Dig it all up, hold it up into the light so we can see it for the ugliness that it is. Because only then can we deal with it. Right. Well, that wasn't fun to say, was it? <laughs> Probably wasn't fun to hear. Church usually isn't. Hmm? I said church usually isn't. So, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 is, a, is an interesting verse. I was thinking about this. Kind of where in the Bible does it really teach us this sense of God wanting us to, to kind of be aware of our sin? And um, 
the Old Testament is, there's no grace in the Old Testament, right? The Bible, uh, those of you that are newer to all this, you know, Bible stuff, there's an Old Testament, a New Testament, and the, the Old Testament's all about do this and don't do that and, you know, ceremonies and all this kind of stuff. And then Jesus comes and the church is established. The New Testament's full of grace. The Old Testament has basically existed to say you're a sinner. <laughs> that's, that's why the Old Testament was there, to say you can't do this on your own. You can't even keep the Ten Commandments. But he didn't just leave us hanging. He said, I've got a way. You can't do this, but Jesus will help you. So here, here's God, right? And I know, I, I, I can't imagine this, but this is the truth as I understand it. This is what the Bible says. God, Jesus, the Spirit, they're all in heaven. And they devise this plan before the foundations of the world and say, this is what's going to happen. Because when they realize that they can't do it on their own, at the right time, Jesus is going to leave heaven and be born of a virgin and live a sinful, sinless life and then die one of the worst, ugliest deaths that has ever been conceived by man so that everyone that believes in him can be saved. Thank God. Isn't that amazing? God became man and died for your sin and for mine. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, and I'm again reading from the NLT, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Hmm. Uh, one of the newer translations, the, the message says the, 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 <clears throat> the law teaches us that we're all complicit in one another's sin. It's interesting because we'll say, well, you know, those sinful folks over there, can you believe what those people are doing? I'll say, yeah, I can believe what they're doing because I'm a sinner too. Once we understand that we're a sinner, we quit blaming others. We quit setting ourselves apart from people who are sinners. We include ourselves in there. And it doesn't matter what our sin is if you're aware of your sin. Step eight is saying to get well, you've got to become keenly aware of your sin. You don't get to skip the step. It's been tried before. Yeah. <laughs> Many times. Or leave a couple of them out. Yeah. One, one young man... I can tell you squirming and struggling and um, and there's just one really, in his mind, one big sin that he didn't want to share. He was uncomfortable sharing. And once he shared it with me, I could kind of understand why, right? I mean, it was like, okay, wow. But you know what? Don't we all have that day? Oh, that day we wish you would take back. Or days, minutes, or hours, or weeks when we say, what was I thinking? And, and this is that step that we go back into that. We realize that not just the world is broken, but I'm broken. I'm broken. And when we realize that we're broken, that's when we begin kneeling in front of the Savior, and that's when God does his best work. When we quit trying to do it on our own and we let him take the reins so we're going to cover four steps here and then and then wrap it up with a willing part but the first point we're going to cover is god wants us to look closely at our sins he, he wants us to you may not want to i may not want to but he wants us to number two uh there's a purpose a really good purpose for this shame and guilt nobody likes to feel guilty Right? You make me feel guilty. Yeah, really not. Right? There's just something that's being discussed that brings up guilt and shame in you. And there's a good purpose for guilt and shame. That same purpose, the same thing that at some point in time can be good, at some point in time that same shame and guilt can be really, really bad. That's kind of point number three. Is that what is good for you in the right context at some point can destroy you. That's shame, shame and guilt. And destroy. And then the fourth point here is uh, uh, God doesn't want you to feel any of that. He wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to be free. 
That's what we're all here for. We want you to experience freedom. And we're not saying that because we're nice people. We're here because that's what he wants for all of us. That's what Jesus died for, is for us to experience freedom. So um, let's see if I need to cover anything more. So we talked about Romans 1, 3, uh, and 20. Um, the world is broken and sinful. We're complicit. As we enjoy salvation by grace, our clear memory of the past reminds us how we got here. Our, how our decisions brought dire consequences to our lives and the lives of so many others, right? We start connecting the dots. Like I'm in this, I'm in this pit, I'm in this slop, just like the prodigal son, right? I'm with the pigs and feeding pig slop, and and I want to blame others. I want to blame my parents. I want to blame circumstances in life. I want to blame you know where I was born and other things that happened to me. But only in realizing that I'm the reason that I got to where I'm at. Can I begin to get well? I'm my problem. And when I recognize I'm my problem and the decisions I made, God can do great work in that. And so he wants us to repent. Uh, you Look at uh, Robert, do you mind 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10? Will you do that for me, please? Doesn't matter what. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Who will read Ephesians 2? Four to seven. Anybody want to do that one for me? Got that one, Deanna? And uh, that'll be good for now. Okay, go ahead, Robert. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So there's sorrow... So when we're sorrowful, we're feeling bad, right? And we'll say, well, don't make me feel bad. You're making me feel bad. So in this context, we would say, that's the whole point. Right. We want you to feel bad. Not because we're trying to make you uh, condescend to you or put you down. It's because you're dealing with the ugliness of your sin. And if that makes you feel bad, that's a good thing. That shows our heart is sensitive, that it's still tender, and we're convicted by our sin. And there's two outcomes here. When we feel bad, it's godly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Repentance, repentance means change. And not just a degree. Repentance means turn it around going the other way. So we would broadly say, you've been doing your own thing. How's that working out for you? Right? And, and he said, turn around and go the other way. Follow God. Don't follow yourself. Follow God. So that's the part that is healthy. This shame, this um, feeling bad, this guilt serves a purpose. So if in your life, on your own, a conversation comes up, it may, it may not even have anything to do with you, but in the, in the conversation, it's a trigger. It takes you back and you start feeling guilty. That's not a bad thing. Just acknowledge, yeah, man, I did some really stupid stuff. I can't believe I did that. I have repented and then we can move on. When we have repented of that, God forgives us. Now, this is in the context of being a believer, being in God's family in his church or kingdom God forgives his people when they repent and so when we when we simply admit it and and we're convicted deep in our course like, I cannot believe I said that did that made that person feel that way we apologize we make amends God forgives us the second point I wanted to share is that it it really when you think about it um, we've seen victory. Robert and Dean and so many others here. Uh, Keith have shared, right? You got a year. Man, it's just awesome. Victory, right? So, so what it does is it says, even in all of our ugliness, God is God. God does great things. Just like that song said, look what you 
have done. So Ephesians 2, you got that one? Four, four but, through seven. but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Kindness, grace. On your worst day, if your path had crossed Jesus, he would have stopped. He'd put his arms around you. He, he wouldn't have forced himself on you, but he said, can I help you? Can I pray with you? Do you want something better? He would have taken you and me by the hand and led us in a better path. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what we have done. That's who he is. That's how much he loves you and me. When we begin looking at it differently rather than how I looked in my sin, but how I look now because I'm looking at myself through God's eyes, mm. that begins to shift. Because this, this, um, re, uh, this shame and guilt, if we're not careful, we can wallow in it, right? And, and it could be defining. I am fill in the blank. An addict uh, of whatever. And that's our identity. Rather than I'm a Christian, our sin can become our identity because it's so consistent, it's so it's so long, it's so deep. All of our friends are engaged in the same stuff. It's kind of who we are. It's it's just part of our life to such a deep level that it's hard to break away. Because I'm leaving friends, mm -hmm. I'm leaving a life, I'm leaving what you know, everything I know. And yet, Jesus would say, "Oh, what I have is so much better." Doesn't feel that way. It's scary, right? But we. The third point here is that we don't want to wallow in it. It begins to work against us. That that uh, worldly sorrow in Second Corinthians seven ten it contrasts godly sorrow with worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow, we would say, is I got caught, right? Mm -hmm. You know, your wife catches you and you say, I'm sorry, sweetie. Well, you might really be sorry. And if you're really sorry, now you're trying to go a different path, right? If you're sorry you got caught, you're just going to be more careful in the future. One is change and the other is not. So as we're thinking about this, right? I, 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 I gotta pull this, dredge this all up. I'm gonna feel bad. That's a good thing. But don't wallow in it, that's not a good thing. But God, when I dredge it up, can take that, as we say here at church, that mess, mm -hmm. and turn it into a message. He can transform your life. He can change your friends. So, so this is all woven into scripture. Whoever's not left, right? Uh, brothers and sisters and mothers and father and houses and jobs and all that for my sake. He says they will find new fathers and mothers and houses and sisters. You know, I, I don't share a lot of my story up here, but my, my first wife, a sweet lady, if you met her here, you, you would think she's an awesome person, but she's still today struggling as an alcoholic. And because of her struggles, my boys did not have a mother. But God provided countless mothers, uh, young men that were my son's friends, who were in nuclear families, all God-loving people. They loved him. And one, Alice, I'm thinking of, loves him as if he was her own. And there's two or three others that love him almost that same amount. And that... That allowed him to heal. That allowed him to, to be loved by a woman and understand what that's like because with his mother's sickness, she was unable. 
God provides what we need when we follow him. So this fourth point is God desires that we live in freedom. Uh, John 8, 36. Anybody got that? Keith, you got it? 8, 36? John 8, 36. Just 8, chapter 8, verse 36. It's red letters, too. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Yeah, it's like an exclamation point. Underline. If Jesus says you're free, guess what? You're free. You're free. Indeed. So how does he do that? He does that by paying the price that you should have paid mm. for your sins. And he does that by loving you in spite of yourself. Loving you in spite of everything you've done. Loving you because he is your savior who wants to be your Lord. Only through him can you understand what true love was always meant to be. Mm. What you didn't have growing up, what you didn't have that led you down these paths of darkness, he is there to provide that. And only he could do it. Amen. But he gives us freedom. Romans chapter 8. If you get there before I do, go ahead and read it. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. You know, one of the reasons, I believe, that the whole 12 steps were men of faith. They came up with these steps, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years ago. But why, why did they go say, I'm Michael, I'm a fill-in-the-blank, right? I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, I'm a whatever, is, is we're simply, this is, this is our issue. But it, it doesn't define who we are. But by being able to say, yes, this is my sin, we understand that when, as we embrace each other here, that that's how God embraces us. There is no condemnation. I hope one of the reasons why you, you draw yourself here, you come here, is because you have acceptance. This is a place where you can be who you are. You don't have to act a certain way. You don't have to be somebody. This is where you can be loved for just who you are. We're trying to do that imperfectly. God does that perfectly. He loves you. And he wants you to be free. Uh, years ago, I told the story about the, about the elephant and the rope and this big elephant uh, was there and he, he didn't have a rope but the, the little elephant was tied to a rope and the guy would come by visiting his friends and at some point in time he noticed that the little elephant wasn't tied to a post by the rope. He says, How, why don't they run off? I mean, these big, huge elephants. He says, we just need to keep them tied for a time. And after a time, they continue to think and behave wow. as if they were tied. Does that resonate with anyone? Hmm. You just think you're in bondage. Mm -hmm. You just have been convinced there's no hope. that there's no hope, there's nothing you can do, that you can't break free. You've just been convinced it's not true. That rope, when Jesus died on the cross for you and me, it was untied. And now it's just up to us to accept it and to begin following him. Right? As we just baby steps follow him, life gets so much better. So this last part is willing and unwilling. This, this step says we, we need to, to think about all the folks that we've hurt. Right? And then be willing to make amends. What keeps us, well, let's re, what makes us unwilling to do the right thing? Just shout out. Control freak. <laughs> that was from, you that was from me. Repercussions. <laughs> don't want to give it up. Right. Repercussions. Repercussions. Uh, comfort. Pride. Comfort level. Comfort level. The Secrecy. truth. Secrecy. 
Secrecy. Yeah. All kinds of things, right? Very unique to us that, that make us, eh, I don't know if I want to be willing. <laughs> you know? But God says you have to be willing. It's so cool, that story of uh, the lady with the, with the issue of blood, right? Yeah. So I heard about this fellow named Jesus. And I, I, I don't know, don't say how far she went, but she was willing to go to him. She was willing to reach out to him. She was willing to get close enough to touch it. Not him, but his rope. And then when he looked around and said, who did that? She was willing to kneel at his feet. She was willing. God does great things. Amen. With willing people. God does not do great things with unwilling people. We have to cooperate, don't we? You have to be a part of your recovery. You have to join with him in your recovery. We all do. And when we become willing, he can do miracles. So uh, I'm going to read one more scripture. Write that verse down. First John chapter three. NIV. Sometimes the wording's a little better when translation. Helps you make your point a little bit better. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. If you lavish gifts, you're not really worried about how many and how much, right? If you lavish time, on someone you're not worried about how many and how you, you know it's it's abundance it's overflow mm. it, it's unreasonable it doesn't make sense right why are you spending so much fill in the blank people would say that's that's too much that's what God does for you and me he gives us too much he lavishes on us his love that we should be called. Think about that. You and me. I, I, I truly, I got there. One of my favorite pictures is my mom pregnant with my dad. They're smiling, grinning, you know, ear to ear with our trailer behind them. I think it's Bill's Trailer Park in Garfield Heights, Ohio. You know, I'm truly trailer park trash. <laughs> That's where my story begins. Neither of my parents went a day to college. Never thought about going to college. Never gave it the first thought. Mom was born on a farm in Bluefield. Dad was born in a town of 500 in Granville, Tennessee. Now, the rest of the story, in terms of how much I was loved, and the example there says pretty doggone good. Meager beginnings, but good people. Hmm. Some of you can't say that. But you and I, because of his love, we're children of God. Amen. Wow. And that is what we are. Exclamation. That's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they don't know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what, we'll, what we will be has not yet been made known. He's not done with you yet. 11 months, brother. It's going to be like in 11 years. One year, you're a young fella there, Ben. Can't wait to see 10. Right. Four? You can put in 40. Striving for it. What God can do with willing hearts. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Mm. That's that journey, right? 
just incrementally growing to be more like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. We're just trying to do a little better every day. That's all we want to do, just a little better. We're going to fall. Some, we call it a relapse. Sin is sin, right? We, we, we get off track. Guess what? We repent, we get back on track. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. You know? It can be. Family, friend, young fella, bright. This whole world ahead of him, 21 years old, a senior in college, uh, degrees out the wazoo, straight A's. He parties a little bit too much one night, 3 o'clock in the morning, tries to pass a car, hits another car head on. Mm. Sometimes our stupidity, our bad decisions, it is the end. Most of the time, it's just an opportunity to learn, to do something better, opportunity to repent. Um, I used to tell Taylor all the time, brother, don't die on me. Mm. Don't die on me. So that's, that's what I'm going to tell you. Don't die on me. Because as long as we're living and we're willing, God can do great things. Yes, he can. Amen. Dennis, do you have something you wanted to say? First off, thank you all for being here tonight. This is one of our highlights of the week right here. It's coming Wednesday night. Yes, uh, I think I could vouch for just about all of our leaders when I say that. Uh, thank you, leaders. Thank you, Michael, for teaching. Keith, for opening. Just everybody behind the scenes. But I love what you said, Michael, about Jesus. Jesus will give us the life we always wanted but never had. I don't know if that's exact wording, but that's paraphrased that. That is so true. I mean, if we just give him a chance, give him a chance. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you have to be a part of your own recovery. I liked when you said that. that is, I mean, that hit me sitting back there. So, man. But a couple announcements real quick. Don't forget Financial Recovery 101 with Jeremy. He'll be here for a few minutes. If you want, got any questions or anything, feel free to to talk to him um, next week Dean will be teaching step nine so make sure you guys are here hear that one um, we're here till eight o'clock if anybody wants to hang out with us uh, if you got any questions if you want to talk recovery if you just want to talk I don't care I'll be here till eight um, child care ends down there at eight o'clock as well um, if you guys are on social media follow us on Facebook we've got a Facebook page CR on the hill uh, community recovery is also on Instagram um, and with me recording I've, I've opened a YouTube channel for community recovery too so some of these videos I don't record every week it depends on the teacher it depends on the lesson that's being taught or the people that are here uh, but there is probably five or six videos on there already um, so you can go to YouTube and uh, check us out there if, uh, if you can't be here one night or something um, shoot me a text or something I'll let you know if it's up or not um, or you can go and check it out um, I'm going to close out with this prayer. I got this prayer in an email. Some of you guys may have gotten this. It was come out in a newsletter. Um, I think that David sent a few weeks ago. But before I do that real quick, I wanted to just say a quick prayer. Um, I would had a couple of prayer requests for Joe and Rhonda, a couple of our leaders here. Her name is Francis. Francis? Joe's mom. Okay, Joe's Francis. mom is in the hospital. Um, that's why they're not here tonight. She's really bad shape with pneumonia. They've done a COVID test. I don't think they've got that back yet, right? Um, but they're hoping that she doesn't have that. Um, but say a little prayer for her. Doug and Amy Nelson is some of our leaders here as well. Um, they've been struggling with COVID in their family. And uh, he texted me today and said his daughter's got it now. So pray for them. Just our community in general. We've got a lot of people that's lost loved ones this week. COVID, we had a young guy die this week of a heart attack and his son tried to do CPR on him, 17 years old, and uh, didn't make it, so that was a tough one. Uh, just addictions in general, you know. We've got so many people that are out there struggling that really need to be somewhere like this, whether it's here or any recovery program, but um, I'm gonna pray this prayer. Pray for God to change the world, you know, our world. But, uh, if you will, just pray with me on this. Lord God, 
King of glory, Father in heaven. Save us by your might and answer us when we call. You are so merciful, kind, and compassionate. Thank you for that. Lead us away from temptation and addiction and help us to walk in your ways. Strengthen us when the temptations come and protect us when we are helpless. When the devil attacks us, and he will, with strong desires to sin, please help us to stand firm in your promises, Lord, and see ourselves as victors. When we are completely crushed, Father, help us to keep believing in you. God, may we keep on depending on you instead of man. Thank you for Jesus, and it is in his name that we believe and we will pray. Amen.